Oh, it's so nice to be able to welcome you to a special late show tonight. And I also like to say that uh, Nikki is uh, my co-host tonight. She's uh, learning everything that she can <laughs> uh, whilst there's yet time. Uh, because one day I might not be here. You know, I might be well, somewhere else. Not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pop my clogs, whatever. Not you for know? another, how long did we say? We were praying <laughs> that Hal's going to live to 120 years old, the same oh as Moses. <laughs> last that long. Uh, hopefully the Lord will return by then. But, you know, often we have thoughts, do we not, about what happens when we die? You know, where do we go? What, what is the hope of the, the Christian hope or the biblical view of where we go and what happens? Well, you know, I have such a gentleman uh, at the other side of uh, the continent who's uh, Ian McCormack, and many of you will be familiar with Ian, and he's visiting the UK at the moment. And of course, we're here in Spain, and we want to give a warm welcome to Ian McCormack, uh, probably known more as the jellyfish man for some reason. I don't know why, we'll soon find out. But Ian, thank you so much for being with us this evening. God bless you, brother. Wonderful to be talking to you again, Howard. And bless you, heaps, man. Wonderful. Yeah, well, of course, we're going to be having a struggling a little bit tonight with the, uh, the phones and things like that. But, but nevertheless, we're not going to miss this opportunity because I really believe that you're going to touch many lives tonight. Now, instead of Ian sharing the whole of uh, his testimony tonight, because uh, you've heard it a million times, I'm sure. But nevertheless, what we want to do is give Ian an opportunity and you at home uh, live at revelationtv.com is the email address and the uh, obviously the SMS is on your screen as well from time to time. We want to give you an opportunity to pose some questions to Ian. You might have some doubts. You might have some really good reasons why you might think Ian is pulling the wool over your eyes or even better still that he's actually got the truth and he's got something really spectacular and wonderful to share with you. So uh, it's all open and uh, we've got some questions and things. But before we do that, Nikki, what have you got in store first? Yes, well, a few years ago, I'll say a few, I'm not quite sure oh, how you're many not years that old, I I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, Howard and Ian sat down and Ian shared his testimony and Howard put it together as a production called I Can See a Paradise. And to just start off the programme, to give you a bit of a flavour of Ian's testimony and the amazing story, here's a promo video for that production. Paradise. Well, as I was raised in New Zealand, born and bred, um, an outdoor person, love the sea. New Zealand's an island, so fishing, surfing, diving as lifeguard, scuba diving, tennis, golf, you name it, rugby. Just love the outdoors. In 19, I think about in the 19, late 70s, I saw a movie called Endless Summer. It depicted some young California kids with their surfboards traveling the world, looking for the endless uh, summer, no winter, and the perfect wave. We also can't let you leave without doing some night diving. Huh? Tonight? We're going for the lobster, you want to come? What about the storm? Ah, it will pass. We came down to Riviera Noir, which is on the outer reef, and dropped in. I then, unfortunately, swam into uh, this box-shaped jellyfish. Now, one of them stung me. And it felt like thousands of volts of electricity went through my arm. So it literally shook me in the water. And God speaks to her. Your eldest son, Ian, is nearly dead. Pray for him now. Battle to stay alive had finished. Start the CPR. He's still flatlining. Stop that now. We've lost him. And reflecting upon that, from what I can ascertain from the hospital, they lost me clinically for a period of approximately 15 minutes. You deserve to be here. I mean, deserve to be where? Where am I? You're in hell now. Shut up. I don't believe in hell. One man living the dream. One life-changing moment. Don't miss Ian McCormack's incredible testimony of death and hell, life and heaven. One man's personal account of passing through the veil of death and standing in the presence of God. Eternal life begins when you give your heart to Jesus Christ. Eternal life begins that day. Watch this incredible interview exclusively on Revelation TV. 
There we go. So that's just an overview of Ian McCormack's amazing testimony. And that can be seen as we saw there on Howard's personal YouTube channel. If you just go on YouTube and type in Talk God, you'll be able to find it on there. And we do want to remind you, we are live and interactive this evening. Your questions have already started coming in. So I'm going to ask Ian some of those in a moment. But we also want to hear from you today. If you've had any near-death experiences yourself, have you had any supernatural experiences of going to heaven or going to hell and then coming back onto earth? We'd love to hear you stories tonight you can email in live at revelation tv.com or text the number on your screen so ian i hope you are still with us i uh, welcome you to the program i have a question from satinda here already there's good evening to you all ian easily has one of the greatest testimonies ever what's special about it is that it gives us hope for our unsaved loved ones even at the point of death I have watched the film about his testimony, The Perfect Wave, starring Scott Eastwood many times. However, there's one co question I always wanted to ask. Ian describes in detail what he saw when he went to hell, but was there any sense of smell or feeling such as heat on the other side? Blessings from Satinda. Um, an interesting question. I actually found it to be actually cold and dark. And what we find is that the scriptures tell us that Death and Hades will be cast into a lake of fire. But this doesn't happen until the final judgment. And so Jesus hasn't returned yet. So it says men are held in darkness until the day of judgment. So I didn't have a sense of um, a smell and certainly no sense of heat or fire. Hmm, interesting. Thank you, Ian. Um, we also have another one from Chanda Kumar. Good evening to you. It's quite long, so I'm just going to read uh, this main part that says, um, Ian, I saw the video footage of you going through death experience shown on Revelation TV and your experience of being in hell and went to paradise in heaven. I do believe it. I myself experienced God in my vision, seated on a throne and saw planet heaven like you saw it, but I did not see hell. As I looked at the video footage, I, uh, I found a crime was taking place on it. Cairo fishman's knew time of day the jellyfishes in the seawater, but they were eager to take you to the spot of seawater. They were fully suited, but you wasn't. It was a wicked plan to take your life because they have ragged hatred towards you. You might not agree with it, but this is the truth. Ian, what do you think of that? Um, well, I, I found the water was very warm, and so I had a short sleeve wetsuit on. The other fishermen who lived in Mauritius all their life found the water to actually be cold. So they had full bed suits, hoods, booties, steamer. They, they were completely protected. And I remember talking to Simon, who was I was diving with a Creole fisherman later. He said, and I thought I'd, he'd heard me say, don't come in. He had seen them already. And unfortunately, I hadn't seen them. So my forearms were exposed and my, my neck was exposed. And so it's just one of those things. God used this incredible experience to save my soul. And thank God for my brain mother, incredible brain mum, who was interceding for me at that time. So that's a good, one of our first questions here is to talk about your mum. You know, obviously you probably got to know more when you went home to New Zealand uh, following this uh, uh, incident. Um, and what did your mum have to say about how God spoke to her? What, you know, it must have been a lot more than what we shared in the film. Well, she burst into tears when she saw um, what had happened. When I shared my testimony, she just wept. And I just gave my mum the biggest hug and said, Mother, your prayers are so instrumental. And, um, and even Dad confirmed the fact that she had almost God had spoken to her and she had run into her bedroom. The Lord said, your eldest son Ian is nearly dead. Pray for him now. It seems as though mothers know when their children are in trouble. And um, Cheryl Ladd played my mum in this movie and um, she had got saved herself. And I said to her, oh. what was the key for you, Cheryl? She said, I was in Hollywood and my mum was praying for me and I'd lost my marriage and I was at the end of my, you know, my, my I just couldn't, didn't know where to turn. And uh, my mum prayed and, and the Lord came to me, yeah. saved my soul. So praying mums, absolutely instrumental. My mum has actually just passed a month ago oh. in her sleep at 90 and... We just spent the last five years with her in New Zealand, loving with her, reading the scriptures, singing her old hymns and, 
and reading Psalms and oh, it's just been so precious. Um, she's in glory. Oh, do you know one of the things there? We just showed a little bit of the film. Um, obviously, the guys in the control room have got uh, bits of B-roll. They're not necessarily au fait with the film, but that showed uh, Cheryl Ladd also playing your mother there, talking to you as a young boy. Because I remember in the film, you actually are depicted as uh, well. You know, I, I'm not really interested in. Uh, in God, more or less, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, he, and then I remember your mum saying something quite special to you in the film. Do you remember what that was? Absolutely. I had been asking the question when I was confirmed, Dad, have you ever heard God speak to you? And he hadn't. So I asked my mum and she said, yes, son, when, when your grandmother died, my mum died, I had no one left and I got on my knees in my bedroom and said, God, if you're real, speak to me. She said, in that bedroom, the Lord appeared to me, spoke to me, and I know he's real. That's why I've been taking you kids to church since that point. And um, I think it's incredible because she then said to me, as I was questioning whether God existed and whether I could ever hear him, she said, son, no matter what you do in your life, no matter how far from God you may find yourself, if you call out to God from your heart, God will hear you, and he will forgive you, son. And thank God in that ambulance, the Lord's Prayer appeared. I asked Jesus to forgive me all my sins. I forgave others that have sinned against me and surrendered the will of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Those who call upon his name shall be saved. Amen, amen. Ian, what advice would you have for some parents that might be watching this evening, or grandparents even, that have young children or teenagers who they've been brought up in the faith, but they're kind of struggling or rebelling against the faith? What, can, what advice and encouragement can you give the parents to how to handle that situation? Um, I think love is the greatest and the power of prayer, particularly where two agree in prayer. So mums and dads, family members to agree. And most of all, love them. No matter what they do, no matter what they say, love is the greatest. Mm. Love covers a multitude of sins. God mm. so loves us that even while we're sinners, he reaches out to us. Yeah. And I pretty much like what was said in the film there uh, was, you know, uh, your mum said to you, you know, no matter how far you are from God, son, no matter where you are, what, her, what have you done? You know, just call on him. And that's something that came back to you when you were on the ambulance on the way to hospital, wasn't it? Absolutely, Howard. And the key is to pray from your heart. Uh, the, the heart is the key. Because if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Okay, that's it. That's it. Let's let's have a look at uh, any more emails. Well, yeah, Eddie yeah. from Birmingham has just emailed in with a very interesting question. He says, "Hi Rev TV. I'm an unbeliever, but I don't think Ian is a con man. I often wonder why Christians who claim to have been in heaven never think to ask God something very important, such as asking for a cure for cancer." Well, I've got friends who've got different gifts and some of them have been shown incredible stuff by the Lord. And some of the greatest, um, I think, inventions that we know of have come from Christian believers. And I, I didn't ask that. I, I was just so amazed at the time meeting him and experiencing his love and forgiveness. And it was what was in his heart. He said to me, Ian, he showed me a multitude of people. He said, I want you to go back and tell them what you've seen. He said, I am the light of the world, and in me there is no darkness. And I wish that all people would come to know me. And he showed me just so many multitudes of people. He said, they won't come to church any longer, and they won't believe. I want you to go back and tell them what you've seen. The eternal life is incredibly important. And um, people will die. They will die of old age. Some will die of cancer. But the greatest thing that God wants to do is save your soul. Those who call upon his name, a free gift of eternal life will be given. And thank God we'll get a new body. Thank God he will transform this clay vessel and put on a body with no sickness, no death, no more pain. Mm. Can't wait. Yeah, and neither can we. I can't wait either. <laughs> and I've been waiting 50-odd years. But um, 
It's still hanging in there. But you know, what I really like as well is for you, as you were saying, and it's a good question that was posed by the, the caller just now, um, was that, you know, your, if I remember correctly, well, you were so enamored at, at, at God's love and forgiveness because it didn't matter what you've done. You said, well, I've slept around, I've taken heaps of drugs, I've done this, that and the other and more love, more love. And, and then you saw what, what the new heaven uh, was all about. And you said, you know, why do I want to go back? I mean, you know, and God said, well, but if you go back, look at all those people there. And then there was your mum uh, amongst that crowd of people. And you've testified to so many thousands of people. It's unbelievable. So that was your calling. It wasn't to ask a question uh, with all due respect. You know, what's the cure to cancer? The cure to cancer and everything else, the cure to life is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that new heaven and earth is coming soon for all of us. No more sickness, no more Absolutely. death. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Howard. And the key was that the Lord said, because I'd asked forgiveness from the ambulance and, and from my heart, yeah. sincerely repented, he said, I'd washed you with white as snow. He said, my blood cleanses you from all sin. Yeah. Now, without repentance, there's no forgiveness. But if we humble ourselves and ask for that forgiveness, he will come. And I stood before him in all his radiance and glory and splendor. I was weeping, I was so full of joy and love. And I think what's amazing, too, is that I've prayed for a, a number of people with cancer and seen the power of the Holy Spirit come and completely heal them. I've seen people with stage four cancer, terminal wow. cancer, sent home to die. And I've seen them totally healed. So one of the greatest cures for cancer is a touch from heaven, mm. a touch of the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus, seeing people healed. Mm. Oh, man. Well, Martin's got a comment here. He says, I'd like to thank Ian for continuing his earthly testament that God sent him back to his loved ones for. It just shows the power of prayer from parents and loved ones, even when that recipient is totally unaware. Blessings from Martin. Very mm. true. Arwen also says, amazing testimony to God's glory. God bless from Arwen in South Wales. Um, Dory's got a question. She says, hi, guys. Nice to see you again, Ian. While I do believe in your account of heaven and hell, some who I've shared it with don't quite believe, quoting, don't quite believe, quoting scriptures that say, once you're in hell, you don't come back out. How would you answer that? God bless from Dory. Oh, well, Jesus himself walked through there. Um, he said, nothing can separate us from the lo love of God and we can life, death, principality of power. So there's nothing can separate us. In fact, the David, King David in Psalm 23 said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forevermore. So we find that you don't have to die and go to hell to experience it. You can actually find hell on earth. But we can walk through the darkest place, the most evil place. But praise God, Jesus has been through it. He holds the keys of death and Hades. He has power over death. He has power over Lucifer. And so as followers of Christ, greater is Jesus within us than he is within the world. Nothing can separate us from that love. And, and I love the fact that um, his light is always more powerful than darkness. And when the kingdom of heaven comes within us, we, we have eternity. We have eternal life. We are connected to the love of God. And um, as he says, we can't be separated from him. Mm. What I like about the fact, uh, and I always say this to people who are perhaps a little bit iffy about whether they accept well, your experience or not, is I say, you know, this, this young man that used to be a young man um, uh, has spent the rest of his life telling the same story and it's not um, I mean it had such an impact on you of course because it saved your life but also such a powerful uh, you know sort of experience you, you nobody would want to you know go and be a you know a dustman or um, even a, a scientist or whatever from that I, I think you, your testimony that you've stayed faithful to declaring the goodness of God with as many people as possible and the love of God, which, uh, you know, surpasses all understanding in that sense, is so powerful in itself. And I want to thank you personally for being that testimony. Uh, it's a living testimony. Thank you, Ian. And thank God for you guys. And Howard, I love the program and, and Revelation TV Genesis that you're actually trying to get people out to hear the gospel. And what, what blew me out was that Jesus was just glorified. <laughs> it was here 
was so white and his arms of love were reaching out towards me. He had robes of light and his face, it was the face of God. It was like the whole universe was coming out of his face. It's like if he spoke galaxies, constellations would come forth. It says when you've seen the face of Jesus, you've seen the glory of the Father revealed in the face of Christ. Mm-hmm. That he is the exact representation of the invisible God. That he is the true light of the world. Alpha and Omega. His face shines like the sun in full strength. Revelations 1, 13 to 18. This is the most powerful picture of a resurrected, glorified Savior. Mm-hmm. He's not just the Son of Man. He is the Son of God, risen and glorified. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm. I and the Father are one. Yeah. How incredible that we can look face to face and be transformed from glory to glory, and that he will impart his purity and his holiness into us. He is holy. He is totally pure. And he can literally set us free. I love it. Yeah, Do you know, um, we're all we're discussing here what what we can uh, question we can put to you next. But let me remind the viewers, please, this is an opportunity. It doesn't happen every uh, every week or every day or every year to have Ian McCormack here uh, with us uh, through. You can actually ask your questions and, and any doubts that you have. Don't be afraid. You know, w- w- Ian's got nothing to hide, and neither we, do we, because we just believe that the Holy Spirit will minister to people through this program. So. Do write in live at revelationtv.com and the SMS number. Well, Dave does have a question. He says, a lot of people have said they saw heaven, then came back. Could it be that your body was not actually dead, but in a state of shutdown? And because somewhere in the back of your mind, you knew God and Jesus really existed and you just dreamed everything. What proof do you have that it was not a dream? And that's from Dave. Good question. Yeah, well, actually I never dreamed, but (laughs) I seem to have visions. But... What's fascinating is that when the neurotoxin of the box jellyfish is potentially the most lethal toxin known to man, and it is a neurotoxin, which means that it actually kills your neurological system, and when it gets to the brain, it kills the brain, your brain dead. So anything that I saw after I was pronounced brain dead had to be out of this realm and not in the mind, not in a dream, not in a vision. And so when you've been moved to the morgue and pronounced dead for 15, it was almost 20 minutes, and come back into your body, anything you've seen there is not a dream or a vision or a hallucination. It is an actually out-of-body or life-after-death encounter. And I, I was the first one who had to be convinced myself what had just taken place. Um, and it was extraordinary. I think what, what would be helpful to some people is to understand uh, a little bit more on that is the fact that the box jellyfish uh, is one of the uh, most deadliest uh, creatures on the earth, if you can call it a creature, and it has the incredible uh, um, lengths of uh, whatever they are, tentacles or whatever they are, to be able to uh, get, uh, enshri- enshrine you almost in the water and uh, the, the electrical field. Can you just describe what was happening to you at that time and how you did end up in the hospital and that was a reality, um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, of course, everyone will react differently, but the box jellyfish is supposedly the deadliest or second deadliest venom known to man, 100 times more toxic than the cobra. And what's so deadly about it is that it is paralyzed. And then when it uh, hits your neurological system and, of course, shuts down your brain and heart and actually kills you, um, it's a, you flatline. And exactly what happened to me, I flatlined. Many people have had what's called a near death, where they have been heart dead, but not brain dead. And sure, you can have starvation of oxygen. You could have, uh, what do you call it, endorphins. There are many different arguments. I'd done veterinary science at university, so my mind was acutely watching what was going on, and when the machines flatlined and I left my body, it was bizarre because I met, I don't know how many people have said that they can look back down on their body. Their physical body's dead, but their spirit is alive, and the scriptures are true. When a man dies, his spirit leaves his body and returns to God. 
And um, I've met maybe 20,000 people over the past 40 years who have died and, and, and had supernatural encounters with God. What's so incredible is that they, a dream will often finish partway through, um, hallucination or random. The people who've had these experiences are so similar, it's, it's quite bizarre. And they, they have a, a beginning and an end. So there, there's no um, cutting of that, which would be in a dream. And so I know without a shadow of doubt, I saw the Lord. Amen. Yeah. And, and Ian, you mentioned in the in the I See Paradise production that you believe that um, when people are dying, the last thing that they do is still hear. So well, how would you encourage people if they know family members or loved ones that are, are currently on a life support machine or they're in the process of dying? What can they be doing to speak to that person in their last moments? Yeah, well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing. So incredibly, God has allowed the ability to hear to be the last faculty in the human body. So if you've got a friend on a life support system, coma, um, they can hear every syllable you say. So firstly, be very careful what you say around them. But if you're a believer and love Jesus, pray out loud. Mm. Tell them, I know you can hear me. Pray this in your spirit. Pray this in your heart. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. Set me free. I, I repent of my sins. I, I forgive others. Lord, I believe. And I have seen numbers of people that are literally in that position and after they've prayed I said look do something you couldn't do and I've had people who are in uh, life support systems open their eyes lift their hands had family members freak out as these people have actually prayed and done something they couldn't do before and it's just an incredible assurance to know that your family member uh, had an opportunity to pray and to give their heart to Christ and for many people I think they haven't sorted out some of the issues they may have had. They haven't asked forgiveness. So it's really important for you to make peace with the person that is dying. And if you need to ask forgiveness, do it. Because there's so much grief with, and, and so much, um, I think, hurt and pain if they haven't had a chance to share how much they love them and, or things they've done wrong that they're, they're sorry for. Definitely. Well, More emails? Yes, we've got Thanks, N that says, um, what an amazing account, miraculous. God managed throughout in an unbelievable, uh, uh, sorry, in an unbelievable way. Ian, thank you for telling us all to have hope. Um, that's from N. Also, Karen in Hampshire says, hi, it's great to hear you give the, all the glory to God and for staying true to Jesus Christ and his power to save, heal and forgive. My question is, where where are you going to visit in England and how can we be invited to hear you share? God bless from Karen in Hampshire. Well, thanks for the encouragement. Um, it's so lovely to be back in the UK. We lived here for 10 years and the last five years we've been looking after my mum and dad who have both passed into glory and we feel again a freedom now to minister. So on Sunday I'll be ministering actually in Wandsworth in West Hill Primary School at 11am. It's just a small church plant. But my website is called A Glimpse of Eternity and in there I have the meetings that I'm doing. Um, this small church actually paid for our tickets to come up just to minister to them in this small church plant and... Um, and we've just loved our connection with them already. Uh, I think we'll also be down in Guildford. And um, hopefully next year we will come back again and perhaps for a more extended um, ministry trip. Yeah. Well, <coughs> let me just re <laughs> uh, put that out again. Glimpse of Eternity is your website, right? Yes. Okay, so and if people want to find out, you keep people posted on there as to where you are and what your movements are, especially while in the UK. Um, I'm sure where people can get there, they will. And that's 11 a.m. on next Sunday, uh, this Sunday coming, yeah? In London, yes. Fantastic. Great. Well, Les says, hello, Ian. Some people may think your so story sounds a bit fishy. OK, I apologise <laughs> for the joke. <laughs> Thanks, Les. I remember going to hear you speak years ago at a meeting. I could tell that you were being honest and that you had a genuine experience. I remember you were asking only one pound for tapes or CDs. So what have you been doing since you went to New Zealand? I hope your family are OK. That's from Les. You know, Jesus said clearly, freely receive, freely give. So in 40 years, I haven't made a cent off my testimony. I've just tried to get it 
out, Manor Christian Bookstore actually in um, Streatham. Um, they are very kindly just selling them for a pound. And that's for the books. And I think the DVDs are around the same. It might be cheaper. I'm not sure. No one uses DVDs. But <laughs> on my website, everything is up there for free. It's in Word document, um, all the videos, all the teachings for free. There's no cost. There's no charge. And so my heart has been to get it out as to the whole world. People have translated it, put into different languages. And again, um, there's no profit that we make on that. Um, my cool. heart is to glorify Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that speaks volumes uh, Glory in our itself? In heaven. <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't know why, but we couldn't find it on the Revelation TV website. So, uh, but I had it on the TalkGod.com. Yeah. So, Talk, Talk God is a, um, a YouTube channel that I started many years ago. But Ian's testimony is on there, but I couldn't find it on the Revelation TV. But it's obviously in our system. Mm. But um, it's in the hands of the broadcasters who actually uplink it all to uh, the Sky uh, platforms, etc. But uh, yeah, try and get hold of it. It's something to pass on. I've been doing it for years, but that's really good. Bless you, my brother. Yes. Well, really we've got good. Anita. She's given um, a testimony on her mum's behalf. She says, it's lovely to see you all. My mum contracted some undiagnosed illness on holiday in Italy when she was 19 or 20. She was in a cottage hospital, unable to eat anything for weeks. They were given her tiny sips of milk all day. One night she passed away in her sleep and found herself outside the gates of heaven. There were two men with long white beards stood outside with a book. Mum didn't have any family she knew in heaven at that time, so she told them she didn't want to go in. They told her that her name was in the book and that she had to go in. Then Jesus came as if across the clouds and mum was back in bed. He stood over her and healed her. She went home fully healed the next day. I came close to death myself when my kidneys were failing and I had an autoimmune amongst other things. God spoke in my ear, you'll be all right now. I got healed. Blessings and love from Anita. Thank you, Anita. Beautiful. So many good testimonies out there. It is, you know, there is a God. You know, the other thing is, Ian, um, with our late Queen Elizabeth II, uh, you know, her faith uh, was shared basically with four billion people uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, how her testimony uh, and being a believer in Jesus Christ uh, has resounded uh, across the world with uh, great respect for, by the majority of people, I'm sure. So we get very few chances to, you know, get the message out to people that we sincerely want them to, to come to know God. Um, what would you say to people, you know, who perhaps are a little bit doubtful, uh, especially these days when we're facing so many crises? Um, I think the Queen was amazing in her life. She was restricted and you know, to share too much publicly. But I believe that many of those scriptures that she chose to be read were literally from her heart. Mm. And um, it said, Death, where is your sting? And the sting of death is sin. But thank be to God. We have victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when we ask him to take away our sins, his precious blood washes us as white as snow. And he comes into our life by his spirit. I just pray that you would call upon the name of Jesus. There's no other name given apart from Jesus mm -hmm. to be saved. Yeah. Now, when you had gone home from after following this experience, uh, I was going to say a terrible experience, but obviously it turned out to be very positive. But, you know, a, a, a deathly experience like that and then seeing the Lord. When you returned home to, to mum and dad and your family in New Zealand, what were your first things to do? What were you, were you thinking? I'm going to ask something which you might say, well, that was ridiculous. But were you thinking about your future career or what you're going to do and just leave that sort of experience behind? What was going through your mind that helped you to come to where you are today? Well, the first thing the Lord told me to do was read a Bible, and I had never read one. And he said, I said, I don't have one. He said, your father has one. <laughs> so I asked my dad for a Bible, and in six weeks I read the Bible. And I realized, unbelievable, 
look, I've been speaking against this, I've judged it from a distance, and I've never read it myself. And my sister, who was milking 360 dairy cows, offered for me to come and work on the farm with them. And I spent the next year with them, and it was an amazing time. Um, my sister came to the Lord, her husband, and the kids were touched, and we baptized them. And while I was on the farm, I was offered a neighbor. He said, Ian, I've, I've got a sheep farm, and I'd like to turn into a dairy farm. 200 cows, uh, potential for this farm. It's across the road from where your sister is. Would you do that? And mm. it seemed to be the next step to do was to just go back into farming. I had done a degree in agriculture at Lincoln. I was a farm consultant. And so my future seemed to be mapped out. And um, while I was milking the cows one morning, the Lord said, Ian, will you follow me? Will you leave the farm and go and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth? Wow. And um, he said, I'm going to give you two choices. You can go farming or you can go out and preach. I've given two open doors before you. Count the cost and choose. And of course. And I chose. I I went to a prayer meeting that night with some of the farmers and a prophetic word came out of Mark 16, 15 to 18. Those who believe to be baptized shall be saved. Those who disbelieve shall be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. They'll speak in new tongues, lay hands upon the sick and they're healed and cast out demons and drink any (laughs) deadly poison. I said, I've already had jellyfish poison and I said Lord that scripture's for me and the Anglican charismatic vicar uh, John Raggett he said I believe that this is a call of God Ian and we as we affirm this as farmers in this community that God's hands upon you wow to go. and they laid hands and prayed I uh, went home and told my family and my mum and dad and sold the cows that I brought and gave my border collie away, which was heartbreaking, <laughs> and took a one-way ticket and began to just preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I wouldn't swap it for all the world. No. no. God calls, <laughs> God supplies. Yeah. Where did you go God first? Was... Sorry, Ian, where did you go first? Oh, the first thing I did was just serve in my local church. It says Jerusalem, then Judea, and the remotest parts of the mm. earth. And I traveled all around New Zealand preaching. And um, I saw a vision of a white ship. And I went to my Messianic friend who was discipling me. He was um, he was a Jew that had got born again. And I said, I've seen this white ship, heaven. And, um, and he, what is that? He said, I've just been to Tauranga. It's called the Anastasis. No. Um, and they, it's, and I said, what does that mean? He said, it means resurrection. I said, God's told me I'm supposed to go on the ship. No. And, um, and so I, I applied, a thousand young New Zealanders applied for this uh, youth of the mission ship. Yeah. And I did my DTS on it and heard the voice of God and um, fear of the Lord and spiritual warfare. It was life-changing. Ian, do you know... Do you know th- that, that's what changed our life. We were on the Anastasis. <laughs> we left the music business behind. We gave it up. We, we never got paid for it. We couldn't care less. And we joined the Anastasis uh, and did our DTS when we were yeah. living in America. And that changed our life. We ended up going to Romania and wherever God wanted us to go. I, 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 you blew me away. I never knew that side of it. Well, this was in 1983 was the second, right. the first one had come out of California, come to New Zealand, and we were the second intake of DTS right. on the ship. We did ours in 1989. Yeah, and then the Lord, I got, Lord said, go to Singapore, and we work with the unreached people. And then I went on, the Lord said, now, fivefold, I want you to go on staff in Rick Stewart's Church, Calvary Charismatic. It's got the fivefold operating in the church. Mm. You know, 24-7 prayer, wow. 2,000 members, 500 churches. And I work with Fred Stewart. Yeah. And the Lord just began to open up um, the nations and working and serving churches from uh, Moravian to uh, Amish, <laughs> from Baptist, right, Baptist, Catholics, right across the world, wow. and serving and, and working with the body of Christ. 
Incredible. Well, Ian, I'm aware we're running out of time in this programme and we've got so many emails coming in, so we're going to try and get through as many as we can. Um, Amanda from Belfast says, Ian, has your experience taken away any fear of man and life's anxieties? Uh, totally. The, the fear of man's a snare. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. Mm. I mean, I really love God and I've come to a place of incredible rest in Him. People may not like you, but the whole security is in God loves you. <laughs> and when you can live in your own skin, live in who you are before him, I think this is the most secure person. You, you're grounded, you're rooted in love. Mm. You're embraced in the love of God. And nothing can shake you. Nothing can. No man can take salvation from you. No man can turn the love of God from you. Um, it's incredible. It's just the healing Father's love. And um, I just pray that each person would come to that place of rest and wholeness in Jesus. He heals the broken heart. He binds up the wounds. He's amazing. Mm. He is, he is. Thank you, Ian. Um, Robin says, um, my question is, despite of praying for many years, Jesus has not spoken to me directly, nor do I know if my life is on the right track as God would want it to be. Living in the UK means spending so much time working and paying bills. How do I request God to speak to me for directions in life? Thank you for Rob, from Robin. For me, the first time, Robin, was the Bible. As I read it, it literally leapt out. <coughs> I, I couldn't believe the words. They just seemed to be highlighted by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I began to underline and even write dates on it, and I still have it where God would speak to me. Uh, he would put a, a thought, um, faith, and then I'd study every word on faith, or a word love, and mm. I'd look at every word on love in the Bible. I then began to find he would also, I could hear him. I could see him in visions. I could hear him speaking to other people, pastors, leaders, elders. I began to see that he would speak in creation uh, uh, through songs. I could hear sermons that were um, sung. <laughs> And so I say, Lord, you're speaking all the time. Give me ears to hear what you're saying. Amen, amen. He is everywhere, isn't he? I think we miss it a lot of the time. We get so busy with life and with our own distractions that we don't realise God is with us every day and he's speaking to us every day. So, Ian, thank you. Amen. Um, John says, could you ask Ian how he would square Bible verse John 3.13 with his experience? And John 3.13 says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Well, the scriptures talk about that. We have free access to the, the throne room of God, we can meet him literally in Hebrews it says that the throne of grace is open. And we see John, John on the Isle of Patmos. He was literally caught up in the spirit and saw Jesus glorified. And we then find 22 chapters of him having direct encounters mm -hmm. with Christ and, and the new heavens and new earth. Mm -hmm. We find Paul talks about it. He said, I know a man in Christ where the in the body out was caught up into the third heaven heard inexpressible words, saw God. We, we, I think we, we can so often take one scripture out of context without the fullness of the entire Bible. Mm. I could also add to that, if I may, uh, if you think about it, the chronological timing of when you're quoting that particular verse uh, by John, by the time, as uh, Ian said, that John wrote or written down the words of Christ, which are direct, he was directed to do in the book of Revelation, was on the Isle of Patmos at 96 AD, approximately. So it's pretty much uh, 40, 50 years after he probably written the book of John. Mm. Anyway, just, just to put that there. Okay. Um, Duncan in the Scottish Highlands says, I'm a civil engineer and I have worked on many projects with divers. I must say that I admire them. My question concerns our soul and spirit. I believe our spirit goes immediately to be with God when we die. Can you confirm that our soul also goes with the spirit at the same end of the silver chain? Our spirit is eternal, so what would happen to it if someone is cast into the lake of sulphur? Blessings from Duncan. Yeah, I find when I died, my soul and my spirit, it, sometimes I think the Greeks try and pull it all apart. Um, the Jewish people said when, when, you, when you die, the inner man leaves the body, the spirit. So when I left, I, my mind, my wills, my emotions, choose, my feelings were all there. So my spirit and soul 
was intertwined. Um, it's me being a man. And so, yes, I believe that when you die, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And it's extraordinary to think that. Um, and the lake of fire, of course, is mentioned when death and Hades, Hades is hell, is cast into the lake of fire. It hasn't taken place yet. That's right. Um, Sarah says, hello, in 2006, I was a young lady of faith, but yet to be filled with the Holy Spirit, a non-proper relationship with Christ. My beautiful Christian mother, who tried to encourage me in the faith at every opportunity, gave me a recording of the jellyfish man's testimony. <laughs> it blew me away then, and it's still so powerful. I thought by playing it to my non-believing husband, it would immediately convert him. It didn't, but still believing and praying for him. Bless you both from Sarah. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Um, this one says, good evening. What a pleasure to see Ian McCormack again. I've stopped counting the number of times I've watched Howard's interview with Ian. I would like to get Ian's thought about Christian suffering. I've been born again 13 years ago and have battled with ill health and other struggles in life. I do know about generational sin and occult involvement in background. How does one keep going in all of this? Thank you for sharing your testimony. Yeah, for some bizarre reason, people ask and um, they have comments and they have hereditary stuff. I just know that <laughs> whatever comes against you, God's grace is sufficient. And in our weakness, his power is perfected. Uh, I've prayed for people and seen them healed. I've seen some I haven't been healed. I don't know why some of them go through such anguish, such pain. But all I know is that God's love will keep you through the darkest hour, through the most difficult, the most evil time. There'll be light at the end of that tunnel. Never give up. Never give up hope or faith in Him. And um, He said, you will have suffering. You will have tribulation. But fear not, for I've overcome. And it's called temporary light afflictions. The sufferings we have are temporary light afflictions in the light of eternity. Amen. Thank you for that, Ian. Uh, Mercy from Kent says, thank you so much for a great testimony. In your account, you said you were given a choice to stay or go back. Do you sometimes fear the risk of missing heaven? Um, no. <laughs> I sometimes wonder why I came back. <laughs> Some of the abuse and flag you get from Christians. <laughs> I mean, the non-Christians are sometimes a lot kinder, but um, that's just the nature of the battle. Um, but yeah, I just, I have no fear of death. I, I have a, a, a touch and assurance of God's love and forgiveness for me. And um, I just can't wait that when we will go back in into his loving arms and move with him through the heavens, the power of that cross is eternal. Mm. His Amen. resurrection life. Somebody has to die. We have to die. <laughs> Resurrection life will come. Jesus had to die, went to the cross. Thank God he died for us. All we have to do is take up our cross and follow him. I have a question, actually, that I'd like uh, to ask you, Ian. We hear, read in Revelation, because it's my favorite verse uh, in chapter 21. And uh, when, this, to when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, I always picture myself uh, in if I can qualify in that sense, uh, that I'll be on the new earth, you know. So is, what is the difference? Did you see any of the, that as, uh, when you were experiencing um, what you did? Yeah, well, this is what John talked about. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old earth and the old heaven had passed away. Peter said in Second Peter chapter 3, 10 to 18, the, this earth and heaven will pass away in all-consuming fire. The elements will melt, be destroyed by fire. But don't fear. I've created a new earth, a new heaven. And what's also awesome, a new Jerusalem, the yes. city of God, which will come out of the new heaven onto the new earth. And God will dwell with us. We will see him face to face. And we will not need the light of the sun the moon or the star, because the glory of Jesus, the lamp of God, will shine so bright, we will live in the light of his glory. 
I, um, I, I love this earth. I'm, I'm living in New Zealand for the last five years. It's like heaven on earth. <laughs> but heaven is untouched perfection. It is what this earth used to look like. But thank God, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. This world will pass away, but my word will not pass away. <laughs> the new heavens and new earth will not pass away. This one will. Your bodies will. But I make all things new. New earth, new heaven, new Jerusalem, new body. Thank God it's not of this earth. Amen. It's oh, prepared yeah. one before us. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. Mm. It's not of this earth. Yeah. Uh, well, I was 21 when I first came across that, that scripture, and I just, that was it. Set me up for life. It really did. Gave me all the faith uh, that I needed uh, to trust in God as well. Uh, we've got loads more e emails. We've got about yes. four minutes left. We've got a couple of prayer requests here, Ian. So um, they're about a few different topics. We've got <laughs> Natasha that says, um, I love listening to your testimony and never get tired of hearing your testimony. It gives me hope for the future. I am a believer and I love Jesus. Please can you pray to the Lord Jesus for a life partner for me. I've been single for too long now and I need a companion. And that's from Natasha. And then we have Kevin in Liverpool that says, um, can, can you ask Ian to pray for healing for Leanne and her dog Lady and myself and my cat Elsa? I believe with all my heart in Jesus's name. Glory to you, Lord, for prayers answered. So that's healing for Kevin and um, Leanne and uh, Lady and Elsa and a companion for Natasha. And I think it's so important. I, I was saying, God, I have no use me looking for a wife. You find one. I just want to pursue you with all my heart. Lord, you have my heart. And Lord, show me when the woman that you've called to be my wife, you show it to me, you tell me. And I think as we pursue God first, as first love, and he's our bridegroom, God will bring the right man, the right woman, and cross as you're pursuing him. And thank God for that. So Lord, we pray that each person who's single that's desperately looking for the right person to marry, as they focus their eyes upon you, that you'll bring them across their path. It'll be a divine appointment. And they'll know that they know this is for eternity. And Lord, we pray for healing for those animals. Lord, I've seen horses healed, dogs healed, cats, <laughs> people. So Lord, you love animals. You love people that your healing presence and power come to all these dear folks and these animals. Let healing flow through them in the precious name of Jesus. Resurrection life and, and just bless them all. Mm. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, we've just got one more comment from John and Tara in Galway. They say, yes, I believe, Ian, my witness tells me this man speaks the truth. So, Ian, you have blessed so many people with your testimony. We can see tonight just how many people have been really encouraged by what you've shared. So we want to thank you. Yeah, with the hearts. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on the program this evening and speaking with us. We have about a minute and a half left. Um, so I just want to just ask you if you any encouragement, anybody out there, maybe anybody who's maybe scared of death or, or worried in the world at the moment, what encouragement in one minute can you give them that are watching tonight? I think the Lord's been speaking to me out of Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will make roadways in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I think we're right on the edge of a whole new era. There's a double anointing coming. There's something incredible about to take place. And I think it's the final and gathering and harvest before Christ's return. Hmm. In Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. We're running out of time, Ian. So. Not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Yeah, amen. amen. Do you know, I just, uh, I'm so blessed uh, to hear your account uh, again, your testimony, and especially about mercy ships and things like that. I didn't know all of that. So I want to say thank you to Nikki for doing a great job tonight as well, and the, 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 the whole staff of two people in the background <laughs> there as well. Thank you very much, guys. And to Ian and your family as well, who've supported you uh, to let you speak to the world the way you've done, and also for the church and all those who support your ministry. Uh, a big thank you and a big hug and hope to see you very soon, my dear brother. Uh, meanwhile, we just thank you for joining us tonight for this special program on The Late Show. Take care. God bless you.